and that would be Mr. Jonathan Blow, game director on The Witness, coming to PS4. Yes. Thank you for joining us here today, Thanks sir. Thanks for having me here. So, you're an, you're an industry legend of sorts. I don't know about that, but okay. I'm going to say I'm going to say that you Some are, sort. yes. Yes. I want to know a little bit more about The Witness because you've it's kind of a cryptic game in a way. It's got a lot of mystique going for it. So, how would you describe it to somebody who's never heard of it? Yeah, it's a very um, it's a very mystery oriented game, right? You start out you don't know what the game's about at the beginning. You start in a tunnel, you're just trying to make your way out of this tunnel and make your way out of this yard, and eventually you're exploring a world and trying to find out what that world is and why you're there and who even you are in this game, right? And in the process of exploring this world, you encounter a bunch of puzzles and you solve the puzzles to progress. Uh, unlike most puzzle games, it's non-linear, right? So you can, if you get stuck somewhere, you go somewhere else, you have a lot of creative choice over how you go about trying to solve the puzzles. Um, and then, you know, threaded through the whole thing, there's a there's a narrative sort of explaining what's going on. Um, it is still a bit mysterious, right? And uh, your understanding of what this island that you're on is, a, is about, why it is there, why these structures have been built, um, will sort of depend on how thoroughly you've explored the game. Now, you've talked a lot about time to fun. And, and The Witness yes. is definitely a game that you, you've said yourself has a density to it. You know, you're in this yeah. open environment, but it's not a Skyrim where you're kind of trudging towards the horizon and, and going in this sprawling, massive environment. It is open world, but it's, it's, a, it's a denser open world with a lot to interact with. Talk a little bit about your approach to that. Well, you know, when we were designing it, what we wanted to do was uh, trade off sort of two interesting constraints. One of them is you're trying to solve puzzles, right? And when, when you don't know how to do something, um, you want it to be clear what's relevant to that and what's not. So, you know, we have this island with all these areas. Great looking the, game, obviously, yeah. too. Um, the areas are kind of self-contained. They try to communicate clearly, like, you're in this uh, walled keep, so, like, only things inside the keep are rel relevant to other things in the keep, right? But then if you walk outside the keep, because you're done with it or you get stuck, you could turn left and walk for 10 seconds and be in a different area, or turn right and walk for 10 seconds, right? So it's been a balance between cramming everything as close together as possible, but not too close, because if it's too close, it jumbles together and becomes confusing, right? And so that's been a super interesting from a design perspective. I couldn't agree more, and I think it's a very, I mean, even just hearing you describe it, I, I know what you, I know where you're coming from, and I know, I get a good sense of how you've structured the game. Was, was that structure, that sort of density and that sort of quick access to, to new content, was that like kind of a response to something for you? I mean, do you feel like, games are just kind of too time consuming now or, or why did you choose that well i think there's definitely a place for the giant open world that you just ride through forever right but nobody's doing the opposite thing and with my last game braid uh it's a platformer game but it was all about being very concise with the levels right they weren't long levels that you kind of run through and there's some monsters there was like only what you need to do in that level and then it's done and i found that to be really nice so when i started doing a 3D open world game, I wanted to take that idea and see what it becomes in an open world. And uh, and the philosophy that I want to really respect the player's time, not have them wasting time or, you know, walking forever just to get somewhere. So, um, yeah, it's just building a world with those constraints and see how it came out. And it, it's kind of nice how it came out. Like, it's a little bit miniaturized. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, it's got its own, like, little, like, feel to it. I, I couldn't agree more. Let's talk a little bit more about constraints because I think creative constraints, I talk a lot about this just with friends of mine, like so I think some of the most interesting games and interesting experiences creatively come about when the creator says, I am consciously not going to do this. It's a creative constraint. I mean, a famous story is uh, John Carmack making Doom, wanting to make a full 3D polygonal engine, struggling and struggling and struggling, the software and the hardware weren't there, and finally going, screw it, I'm gonna go 2D with the rendering technology, and he ends up with Doom, which is an industry legend. That was a creative constraint. How did you approach creative constraints, or what's your philosophy on that? Yeah, so, so with this game especially, it was more constraint from a design direction than a tech direction, right? We have, a, consoles are fast these days, especially this next generation of stuff, right? So it's, uh, where constraint came from was about uh, being very focused, knowing very clearly what the game is about, and only allowing things into the game that strengthen 
that theme. So the witness, there's sort of several layers of theme, but one of them is like, what is it like? Like, what is it like to be in a world where you walk around and see stuff, right? Which sounds like a weird question at first, because like all 3D games, you're in a world and you walk around and see stuff. But those games don't focus on that idea. And when you really focus on it and really like look at the tiny, interesting things, you really can find a lot of stuff. And so that's where a lot of the design material of the game came from. And if we ever did some stuff and it wasn't really fitting with the way the game was unfolding, we would just cut it, right? And just say, well, that's, that's interesting, but it's not the part of the core of this game, right? So just discipline, I guess. Discipline, that's a, and that's a great point. I mean, you, this game is a dense game and you're, you're not running all over the place looking for stuff to do. It's all around you. It's a part of the environment. But how much, that's gotta be a lot of work. I know just, you know, I'm an editor. I've been an editor for a long time. And I know for a fact, uh, for instance, that it's much easier to write a giant article that has a ton of words in it than it is to write something that's a paragraph long. Yes. It's much, much, much harder to write the short thing and the concise thing and the tight thing than it is to do the big gaseous bloated thing. It takes 10 times as much work to do a 10th of the content. Tell me, how much stuff did you throw out when you were making The Witness? A lot, um, probably, you know, things get developed to different degrees. Like some of it just gets sketched out. Some of it, we go and do all the programming and all that. We have probably tossed out about an equal amount to what's in the game over the course of mm. development, right? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's you're seeing the best half of what we could figure out. Um, but it's not even, we didn't make these decisions by quantity, right? It was just by quality bar. Like, is this thing good enough to be in the game? Yes, this, no, this. And, Outstanding. Yeah. So, obviously, you're going to be debuting the game on console, at least, on PS4. Yes. And I, I'm just curious, like, why? I mean, uh, you're, you're, we're all good friends with Nick Sutner. Yeah. He's, on our, he's on our podcast every week. But, yeah, yeah. And I know you know Nick as well. But uh, just kind of walk us through your rationale. Well, uh, coming off my last game, um, I definitely had had mildly unpleasant experiences with some other like platform holders and things, but I saw some of my friends who had games a little bit like a year or two later have massively negative experiences. So that's became very important to me was to like, I wanna partner with someone who's not gonna be like, were the relationships not like, let's just keep kicking you, but you're gonna put up with it because you have to to be on our platform, right? I see. So that was thing number one. Um, and then, just you know, we'd been we'd been talking to Nick actually about being on PS3 because for a while we were thinking we were thinking the game was going to come out earlier than it has, right? Um, like 2011, 2012. Uh, but as it became a bigger, more interesting game, we just said, okay, let's hold it off because it looks like we may end up good timing with the next generation of consoles, and that seems nicer because then we can have better graphics and all this stuff, right? So. From there, it just sort of naturally happened because we were already talking to Nick about about being on PS3, and we said, well, maybe that's not right. When do we talk to you about PS4? And he was like, well, it's a little early, but then you know, some months went by, and and that just went from there. So we were, we got invited to developer meetings very early on, and and got dev kits very early. And, and that's not yeah, that's not typical for a lot of indie developers. I mean, based on what I know, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but um, I don't think it's typical. It certainly was not my experience with the last game. And, okay. um, and it has not been my experience for this console generation with some other platforms, right? I see, okay. The more or less, like some people are a little better, some are not, but sure. what Sony's been doing actually is just really tremendous. Like people out there can't see what's on the E3 show floor, but there's tons of independent games out here. Oh right? yeah. Like all over. Um, and it's really kind of amazing that like, it's not just like, talk like oh we like indies of course haha -ha. but like <laughs> this is this is being represented as like this is what sony's interested in showing the public right now a lot of indie games so um i really like that. like that's great and I'll i think it's not just good for people like me who are independent but it just helps like people out there who are thinking about buying the next console or a vita or whatever it just gives them more variety to choose from right so I think that's good, it's only good, and I don't know why everybody doesn't have a more open policy, well, but I, some people don't, so. From my perspective, I mean, it's obvious, it's a no-brainer why it's so important to, to support indie development, but not everybody knows. I mean, there's a lot of gamers out there who, who play some of the more the blockbusters and things like that, there's nothing wrong with that, yeah. but what would you say, why is it important to support indies? I mean, from your perspective, why is it good for the industry and why is it good for gamers? Well, I mean, a lot of, 
a lot of new ideas. So, so AAA games are super expensive, right? So uh, hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes. And when you're laying out the money to make one of those games, it's very difficult to justify making totally crazy creative decisions because you can make a decision that everybody thinks is stupid and then you just lost $300 million, right? <laughs> So, AAA games tend to be a little bit conservative, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just how it has to be, if they're going to be more or less financially stable, right? Um, but, but then where do crazy new ideas happen, right? Well, what, hap what, what happens is the crazy ideas get explored in smaller, less expensive projects, and, but, but other people in the industry are paying attention, for example, and so if you make a, a crazy game that... Uh, does some new game mechanic or has some new aesthetic, um, other developers tend to pick up on that and it makes its way into AAA over the next couple of years. And you know, that's happened a bunch of times. So, so today's um, indies may well be inspiring the next generation of AAAs anyway. And some of them become the next generation of AAAs also. So Absolutely. you never I mean, know what's going to happen. Activision at one point was a small independent <laughs> operation. I mean, a lot of these guys started out as small indie operations. Yeah. So that's really interesting. But back to The Witness, I mean, that's sure. what we're here to talk about. All right. What are you most proud about so far with this game? I don't even, I mean, it's so, I'm just very happy that we're able to put together something this complex and that it still doesn't lose its heart and doesn't, uh, and doesn't get diluted through just having to be big. Like, a lot of big games, it's just hard to make a game, right? It is. Um, and the bigger the game is, the harder it is to just keep it in one piece and get it out the door. And we're in the middle of that process right now, so I don't want to speak totally in the past tense. Yeah. Like, we have to solve some of these problems, but it's a big, it's like a 25 plus hour single player game, right? Really? It's a lot of gameplay. Wow. Um, and we're a small team, and we've managed to put that together, and it's true to itself at every moment. Like, we didn't try to make it long. It's 25 hours, it could have been 50 hours, but we cut half of it, mm -hmm. like I said. So um, that's been interesting, that, that we can do something special and personal, and it can be bigger than like a, you know, a five hour platformer, which is my last game. So you're at E3, is there anything catching your eye while you're here? Oh, it's very crowded this year, <laughs> because it's console launch year, right? So I have not actually seen very much stuff because there's long lines everywhere, and like, if you even want to get a peek at a screen, you have to like push your way through people, so, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, yeah. Well, one thing I know also, you've been pretty outspoken about uh, PS4 having eight gigs of GDDR5 RAM. Yeah. That's, that's something we've talked about before. I mean, just as a creator, I, I, I'm always interested in how technology like impacts the development process. What, yeah. what does that let, let you do for a game like yeah, this? Yeah, I was a little sad, because I tweeted that, and I was a bit misunderstood in that tweet. So what happens is, so anytime you have a lot of RAM, there's a, lo a number of good things that happen, right? But one good thing that happen is for a certain size of game and below, suddenly they become tremendously technically simpler, right? Unfortunately for us, we're a little big, um, so we still have to like do stuff like asset streaming. So you're at one place in the world and the other stuff isn't necessarily loaded, but there's no load screen, right? Like it, it loads in as you move over here and then it unloads as you go away. That's actually tremendously complicated and introduces a lot of bugs and stuff, right? That you have to, as a developer, then go solve. Um, the more RAM you have, then the more games that are maybe small to medium in size don't have to do that kind of stuff. They can just load up at, at startup and then they're there and you just play them. And that greatly, for some of these uh, more, um, you know, just independent, like I'm pursuing a crazy idea and I want to build a simple game about it. Um, it makes those a lot easier to do. It like, kind of lowers the difficulty bar a bit. You don't yeah. have to do so many like kind of gymnastics with the yeah. development process. Yeah, but then even for, for a bigger game, so so like us, we don't quite fit in you know what the PlayStation's final memory is gonna be, but we almost fit, and that lets us do a lot of things. So we don't need to like tax the, the streaming system so hard. We can make some other decisions about, you know, how much like we can we could have a lot of really high detail meshes in the near ground if we wanted to, if that was like an LOD decision that we wanted to make, and we would have the memory for that, right? It, it wouldn't have to be like, we have to carefully ration the density mm -hmm. of meshes so that only so many of them are loaded. Like, a lot of stuff gets easier. So I've always been a fan of having RAM. I mean, I'm also a fan of having fast CPUs and... Everything, more well, yeah. everything, more right? More everything is good. I don't, uh, you know. More, more everything, okay. So yeah. I'm dying to play this game. When are we finally gonna get a chance to play The Witness? When it's done. When right? it's done. When it's done. Um, we're hoping 
You know, generally in the launch period, we're not going to be out at PS4 launch. We've got a bit more to do than that, but hopefully, you know, early 2014, something like that. Seems like a long time from now as I say it, but that's not, you know, time flies. So, yeah, that's that's as near as I know. All right, I can't yeah. wait. And uh, Jonathan Blow, thank you so much for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Thank you.